he who is your Lord, the all-merciful, cherisheth in his heart the desire of beholding the entire human race as one soul and one body. Baha'u'llah. O children of men, know ye not why we created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over the other. Ponder at all times in your hearts how ye were created. Since we have created you all from one same substance, it is incumbent on you to be even as one soul, to walk with the same feet, eat with the same mouth, and dwell in the same land, that from your inmost being, by your deeds and actions, the signs of oneness and the essence of detachment may be made manifest. Baha'u'llah. Today, we're really happy to have Ms. Linda Kavalin Popov with us, and she'll be discussing Restoring the Soul of Humanity. Best selling author Linda Kavalin Popov is an international speaker on personal and global transformation. She's co founder of the Virtues Project, which is a global initiative to inspire the practice of virtues in everyday life. The project is sparking a global revolution of kindness, justice, and integrity in more than 140 countries and was honored by the United Nations in 1994 as a model global program for families of all cultures. From audiences of corporate CEOs in the United States and Korea, to indigenous villages in the South Pacific, and schools across Australia and Europe, Linda is an internationally acclaimed advocate for social change. The Virtues Project has inspired and mobilized thousands to commit acts of service and generosity, to heal family abuse, and to transform their communities from violence to virtues. Linda is the recipient of a YMCA Woman of Distinction Award and a member of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America National Think Tank on Character. As a psychotherapist, she designs suicide and violence prevention programs used in U.S. cities. She's the author of seven books on virtues and was featured on The Oprah Show, as well as her own TV series in Canada. And with that, I'll hand it off to Ms. Cavill and Popov. I want to welcome all of you today to whatever time it may be for you to focus on something that is, I think, in everyone's hearts at this time. How can we heal humanity? How can we heal the terrible things that are going on all around us? I'm going to be sharing today my thoughts on restoring the soul of humanity from the context of the Baha'i faith. I had the bounty of being raised in a Baha'i family. And in fact, one of my Sunday school teachers from very long ago is here, Molly DeWald, which is really a special gift to me today. Hi, Molly. <laughs> so let me share a little bit about the Baha'i faith and that context. We believe that God in his love for us has revealed himself to us over the ages through many teachers. And that each one of them is like a teacher in a school, giving us the soul work, the task for humanity that is before us and that we are capable of at, from one season to another, from one century to another. And for us, the latest but not the last of these divine messengers is Baha'u'llah, which means the glory of God. And what I want to share with you today, in, in a very brief way, is the vision that he brought to us for the oneness of humanity as the pivot around which all the soul work that humanity is called on by God to achieve in this age will occur. I know that many hearts are broken over the continued violence in Europe and with our little children in the United States. It is inconceivable how many schools and how many places mass shootings are continuing to occur. I'm bringing this up because I feel many people, not only are we suffering from the effects of a plague and economic downturn, but we are suffering from wave after wave after wave of trauma. And how do you deal with trauma? How can you possibly hold on to hope 
or the idealism that you heard in that opening song, that we are all the waves of one tree. Baha'u'llah revealed not just a mere set of ideals and principles, but his, he offered us a way forward, a new way forward, that is an organic change in the reality of the way humanity runs this world. One in which we will take care of the planet, we take care of each other. So what I wanna share with you today is three things that I feel can keep us afloat in this very violent time in which we're living. How do we hold on to our hope? There are three aspects of the purpose of life that Baha'u'llah revealed. And you will hear the echoes of every faith that God has revealed in the past. First, to know God and to love him, which is the same thing as knowing and loving ourselves because we were created in his image. We were nursed at the breast of her love. Secondly, to acquire the virtues of the kingdom, to acquire the virtues with which our souls have been endowed. I've often said that the virtues that each person is uniquely born with, with a great capacity for certain virtues, that was God's gift to us. Our gift to God is what do we do with them? And the third purpose is to carry forward an ever advancing civilization. And Lord knows we need to advance our civilization pretty quickly because if we don't, we're going to lose everything. We've got to protect our planet. We have to guide our children. We have to come together. And how is this possible? How can you feel that you are an agent of change at a time that is, seems so hopeless with the huge divide that is going on right now, emotionally, politically, intellectually, people believe such different things from each other. You know, last night I was watching the news hour, the PBS news hour with my husband. And I noticed the despair on the faces of David Brooks and Jonathan Capehart. I didn't know what they were going to say because they were asked, what do you make of this? What are we to do about this gun violence? And David Brooks said something that I thought was just a glimpse of hope. He said, the worse things get, the more awake people become. And so how do we wake up from this nightmare we find ourselves in with war and all these continuing things? And I don't mean to depress you. I think you're probably already somewhat depressed because of everything that's going on. And a lot of people are struggling with mental health issues. Probably all of us from the, the years of isolation, the last two years, of never knowing when it's going to end. Will life ever get back to the way it was before? So enough about the problem. Let's go to knowing and loving God. I, a story comes to mind about the importance of honoring the spirit, honoring our personal spirit by doing the work we need to do to have a routine of reverence every single day. We need to be deeply reflective at a time like this so that we can discern what is my part to play in this world right now. Um, Baha'u'llah said, you know, I, I love thy creation. Hence, I created thee, engraved on thee mine image and revealed to thee my beauty. So what is my part to play? Number one, and this is a strategy from the Virtues Project, as well as the Baha'i Faith, you must honor your spirit and the spirit of every person you know. And one of the ways to honor your spirit is to have 
a practice of prayer, of meditation, of mindfulness. The story that came to mind for some reason was a time that I was invited to be on the national think tank of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. So I flew to Atlanta and I was in a room with about 12 people, all the members of the board of the National Boys and Girls Club and uh, other people that were involved in character education. They were interested in the Virtues Project, Character Counts, all these other programs because they knew something was missing from the work they were doing with the children across the, the country. And a woman got up and gave a very in-depth talk about her program and had all these statistics and all these, and you know, there was a polite response to that. And then we were talking together and consulting. And I said one thing, if, you, we, don't, if we don't address the spirit of the child, you won't reach them at all. And the whole place ignited. And what I didn't realize is that 90% of the board of directors of the Boys and Girls Clubs are ministers, pastors in their churches. <laughs> and the woman who had given the, the talk, very polished, very or, you know, corporate, she, she came up to me after and she said, why didn't anyone respond to all that work I did? And they responded so much to one thing you said. <laughs> and I said, you know, I just want to honor you for your excellence because you really did present a beautiful program. The truth is that if we don't honor the spirit of our children, if we don't address their spiritual needs, we can't reach them. And so <clears throat> it's very, very important for you to realize that you're not incapable of making a change. You do have some power. And the main power you have is in your own life. Never underestimate the power of the ripple effect because the human spirit is connected throughout this world and beyond. And so anytime that you step up to, for an act of courage that you haven't been able to call to yourself to before. You are increasing the level of courage in the human spirit. Every time you do a service for someone out of pure love, you're increasing the love in the world. And so know that you have a tremendous amount of power to create change. One of the things we talk about in the Virtues Project is to recognize your teachable moments and use the lens, use the frame of reference or what I call reverence of the language of virtues as a way to think about things, to bring yourself to accountability. And this comes under the second purpose of life, which is to acquire the virtues. You know, I had another Sunday school teacher who Molly will remember, her name was Rahil McComb. And <laughs> she used to embarrass me so much because when she talked, she giggled. <laughs> but I'm so embarrassed, you know, I was like a little nine-year-old. And every time we would go home from Sunday school, I'd say to my mother, why do Mrs. McComb have to giggle like that? And my mother would just say, oh, Linda, that's just the way she is. And one day she said to me, I'm going to tell you. And plus, my brothers were doing giggle imitations in the back seat to, to tease me. So one day, my mother said, I'm going to tell you why Mrs. McComb laughs all the time. And she opened a book of photos. And there was Mrs. McComb in the lap of Abdul Baha when she was a little girl with ringlets. And she said, she is happy because she knows the purpose of life. Abdul Baha is the son of Baha'u'llah, and Baha'u'llah is the prophet founder of the Baha'i faith. So she told me that one day Mrs. McComb wrote a letter to Abdul Baha, and she said, Beloved Master, why are we here? Love Rahia. She was about six years old. 
And he wrote her back and he said, Beloved Rahia, we are here to acquire the virtues of the kingdom. Love, Abdu'l-Baha. Now that sounds very simple, doesn't it? But it's the whole purpose of life to acquire excellence, to be patient, to find ways to share your love. As it says in the Baha'i writings, to be the presence of grace to everyone who's crossed path you cross. People are longing for people that will listen to their stories. Everybody has a story and they need someone to hear them day to day. In this group here, there are several of my story keepers who love me and will hear anything I have to say, whether I'm sad, mad, glad, or thankful, or angry, or whatever I am. And we all need to be that for each other. The Virtues Project forms connection circles all over the world for the sake of support. And it is an incredible aid to mental well being to have a circle of people that will not judge you, that honor unity and diversity, and that will uh, be your story keepers. Now, I want to say that. In acquiring the virtues, one of the ways you can do that successfully is to follow one of the things that Baha'u'llah says, which is to bring myself into account each day ere thou art summoned to a reckoning. So every day to bring yourself into account. Now, friends, that doesn't mean to criticize yourself. It means that you look at yourself with honesty and applaud the things that worked well for you that day and call yourself to a better day tomorrow and understand what is beneath the things that, in which you didn't meet the standard that you would like to meet. Just keep aware of yourself. Have a loving, rigorous relationship with yourself so that you can keep acquiring the virtues. One of the things that I really am so grateful for in the Baha'i teachings is that it gives us perspective on the meaning of tests. There's a line that says, thy tests are a healing medicine to such as are nigh unto thee. Now, how could that be? I teach a children's class here in our community in Lanai, Hawaii. And the other day, after we had a lesson on love and we were doing the craft, a little girl kept saying to everyone, you know, bad things happen to good people. And I could tell that the news was on her mind. And so companioned her a little bit, listened to her. And, you know, <laughs> we have to find ways to reach out to each other to hear each other. Abdu'l Baha said, may you always listen, always hear, always speak with the power of the spirit. One of the ways we can call on our virtues is to cross the divide with people who think very differently than we do. We need to absolutely not waste our energy. It is so precious, this energy of life that God has given us. We must not waste it in attacking the system that is out there now because it is lamentably defective, according to Baha'u'llah. It's not working. There needs to be an, an organic change in the very structure of human life and the way we conduct our, our lives and our business in this world. And Baha'u'llah lays that out. You can look at Baha'i.org and see all the principles of the Baha'i faith about equality of women and men, spiritual solution to the economic problem, and above all, world peace. Now, I want to quote something to you as we go on to um, carrying forward and ever advancing civilization. <clears throat> I'm going to read to you a line from a wonderful little booklet that was distributed all over the world, and it was called The Promise of World Peace. So in carrying forward an ever-advancing civilization, we know that this world 
needs oneness and unity around setting the course for humanity, healing the environment, healing the ruptures in our, the way we've treated each other for, for generations. And here it is. Whether peace is to be reached only after unimaginable horrors precipitated by humanity's stubborn clinging to old patterns of behavior or is to be embraced now by an act of consultative will is the choice before all who inhabit the earth. Now that choice, each of us needs to fight our own spiritual battles. We, often, we also need to realize that in the conflicts that inevitably come up in our relationships, we have to find a way to tap into that consultative will to create peace and be one of the peacemakers. And so if you're in conflict with someone, resolve it as best you can. If you have harmed someone, make amends. If you have been unfair, restore justice in your relationships. And, you know, I, I don't, okay, I'm going to use my moderation and not go in another direction. <laughs> I just want to say that um, I think a big part of carrying forward that ever advancing civilization is that we desperately need vision keepers. We need visionaries who hold a vision of one humanity as possible, who hold a vision of world peace as not only possible, but as inevitable. Because we have a huge promise in the Baha'i teachings, which say that at this time in human history, we are meant to be in our adulthood. We've just left adolescence. Now you look around at what we're doing to each other, it's hard to believe. But that is the potential to which, uh, up to which we must live, because that is the soul work that God has given us at this age and in this new era. One thing it's very important to understand to be able to hold a positive vision of what is possible and be one of the optimists of the world is that we are, go and I think this is a very helpful explanation. We are going through simultaneously the death pangs of an old way of life an old world order where there is white supremacy, there is the theft of children from their villages, there is war and all, all kinds of attempts at sovereignty over other nations, there's intense nationalism, and <clears throat> we need to hold a vision of one world that honors the diversity of nations and continues to focus on how do we together create some collective security so that things like what's happening in the Ukraine cannot ever happen again? And how do we reinstate the disenfranchised people that are everywhere? We have to look at them with new eyes. We have to realize we really are the waves of one sea. And we are so interdependent economically that we're really getting the point now that if there is a problem with a supply chain from one country, everybody suffers. We've got to solve it together. And it's the only way we can. So we need to be a vision keeper. And the vision that Baha'u'llah has laid out is a marvelous vision to explore for Baha'is and for people that are of other beliefs. One of the things that we're being guided to as Baha'is right now is to combine our efforts with other like-minded souls to build new communities or to renew a sense of community. And <clears throat> one of the greatest ways besides holding that vision of world peace and equality and equity for every soul and every family in every country is to educate the children. 
Baha'is are following a plan right now. We just got a brand new plan for the next nine years from our international body called the Universal House of Justice. And a part of that is to make sure that in every community where Baha'is reside, we are educating the children. We're teaching them who they are, that they are people of kindness, that they are people with a purpose. You know, <clears throat> my brother, John Kavlin, my husband, Dan Popoff and I started the Virtues Project because we were very concerned about the suicide rate that was one of the main causes of death of youth aged 12 to 24. It's still one of the main causes and murder is the other. Those are the top two causes of death of children. And so we need to educate our children. We need to love our children. If a child is in a family that cannot give that to them, the community needs to do it. You know, none of the children in my little Baha'i children's class are Baha'is. <laughs> most of them are Filipino and most of them are Catholic or of some other religion. And I'm discovering that they don't even know their own faith. So I'm, we're teaching them stories about Jesus. So they understand their spiritual roots. Uh, <clears throat> so healing and building community is another thing that you have agency with. You have the power to do something about it. I think that we need to realize that there is no they, there's only us. If you are in a relationship or you know someone that has really passionate feelings that you totally disagree with, all you have to do is say, tell me about it. Help me understand. And would you like to hear my perspective? I've done that many times and half the time they say, not really, <laughs> but they've already been listened to. And so the relationship, the trust is being built. <clears throat> but I wanna close with, with just a really little story about a time that um, Dan and I were in South Korea and we were speaking to a large group of corporate executives. Most of them were very elderly men and I remember saying to them in my talk, what does it profit you if you gain the whole world, but you lose your own soul and you lose your own family? Because many of them don't know their children. They go to work, then they go to the drinking meeting, and then they go home and fall asleep. And many of them do not know their children. And after that talk, they came running toward us with their little cards in their hand. And the organizer had to get us out of there. He said, you're, it's like you're rock stars. And they're, they're trying to encompass you here. But the passion was because they recognized the truth. And we need to share our truth with people in a way that it makes it useful for them. And I hope this has been helpful for you to hear. And I want to thank you so much for your patient listening and your commitment to be here today. <clears throat> and I just want to say, you can know and love God. You can fight your own spiritual battles. You can develop a spiritual practice and deepen it as time goes by. You can acquire the virtues every day because that's what the world needs. And you can definitely help advance civilization by being a vision keeper, by teaching the children, by raising up these children to be the next generation of vision keepers. Well, thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your, your talk today. And we really are so happy that you were able to join us. Um, and so now, yeah, we have some time for questions and you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Our first question slash comment is, thank you for your work on the virtues. I've used them in Singapore and Birmingham, Alabama, where I was teaching, and now with my children and junior youth in Montreal. I have the book of songs and CDs. Um, the question is, have you also digitized them? The, the songs and CDs? Yeah. 
<laughs> I don't know, dare did we? <laughs> a lot of things are digitized. So uh, I think it's, I'm just gonna refer people to virtueshop.com and virtuesproject.org. There's a lot of things that are digitized. I'm not sure about the songs, but you can you can certainly ask. Okay. And I want to really, I just want to honor you for your service in using the virtues in all those different ways. Yep. Thank you. Do you have any tips to convince the school districts to incorporate virtues in the curriculum? Oh yes. <laughs> There's virtues. The virtues project is being used all over the world, really, in schools. Um, <clears throat> there's someone here that could tell you all about the largest school in the world, which is a Montessori school in India, that is has incorporated the Virtues Project in all aspects of school. Um, I just finished uh, with a colleague a chapter on Virtues and Leadership for a book of that title. And our chapter was on the Virtues Project and how it's being applied. One of the leaders we chose to interview was a, <clears throat> a principal in New Zealand who took a very low performing school in a very poor area with um, children from, often from families that were involved with gangs. She took it from a very low decile, which is what they call it in New Zealand, to the top level school because she introduced the virtues project in all aspects of not just the teaching but creating a whole culture of character of kindness and courtesy and she's gotten all kinds of awards and she's just a great example of taking it and putting it right into the culture so that you know a big part of it is speaking the language of virtues replacing shaming and blaming at whatever age with virtues language calling a child you need to be kind how could you have handled that conflict without violence how could you have been peaceful about it when you felt angry so it's it's a very powerful language and it shapes character and much of that you know all of our work has come from the sacred texts of all the world's religions so the purpose is to make that sacredness accessible in everyday life. Thank you. How can we incorporate this for counseling and therapy for patients without naming a religion and God with the hypersensitivity of people to religion and God? Well, you know, speaking as a therapist for many, many years, um, <clears throat> what I know is that if you don't have the, the practice of companioning, where you ask questions and you allow the person to really empty his or her cup and get to the heart of the matter. If you're just gonna put band-aids on it, or and most counselors don't want to do that, but they often get into an advice mode. And what people need, even when they're in a state of, of suicidal despair, because that was my specialty was suicide prevention and intervention. People need to tell the whole story. So listening with that, those spiritual ears is very important. Using virtues language to affirm them is absolutely essential. I don't know how anybody does any counseling or any conversation without it, to be honest with you. So I always ended my sessions by acknowledging the person for their courage or their hope or their strength or their endurance. And so um, the other thing is that I always ask people, what is your belief? Is, is God part of your life? And I want to tell you, you ask that question, you get right to the, the depths of the person's beliefs about themselves, their hopelessness or their hope. So I wouldn't leave God out of the equation, but it's not about preaching. It's about exploring and listening. I don't know if that's a very good answer, but uh, to me, the whole frame of reference and reverence for counseling needs to be to see the person whole. And, and they are spiritual beings having a human experience. 
<laughs> Thank Got you. A message from my son, which means a lot to me. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the next question is, could you please um, be specific as to how to bridge the gap between two vastly different views? For example, vaccine versus no vaccine, gun versus no gun. Right. right. <clears throat> well, what I think we need to do is to put on a shield over our hearts of compassion and detachment in order to engage in any kind of conversation with uh, another person who's sees everything differently. And get curious, not furious. To stay in a place of sacred curiosity or compassionate curiosity. And if your goal is to understand them, rather than to force them to understand you, you're going to create a bridge between the hearts. But it's gotta be real. And you know, if, if you feel inflamed, then, back away. You know, you're human. It happened to me in the beginning when I was so shocked by some of my closest friends and what they believed. It was like, you what? So I had to teach myself to use some self-restraint and immediately put that shield on my heart. And then I could engage in the conversation. Um, a woman that, that um, I used to go to for a particular service, um, it's, she voted differently for me. She didn't believe in the vax. She actually lied to me that she'd been vaccinated and then begged for my forgiveness. And she is very fundamentalist in her views and once told people that Baha'is were going to hell because they were in the wrong religion. <laughs> and this is a woman that I've gotten very close to because of that compassionate curiosity. One day I said to her, help me understand your beliefs. Help me understand what you feel about this. And um, she talked for about an hour and it was really helpful for me to get underneath those beliefs because I just found them so astonishing. But it's, you know what, it's all in your intent. If your intent is unity, even with the most diverse person, you can do it. But if you can't do it, say, you know what? I'm, let's not talk about this anymore. Let's talk about something else because I want us to be happy together. So let's, let's leave that topic alone. So you have choices. But if you're really brave, you're gonna say, Tell me, help me understand. And then don't retaliate. You know what I did? I gave her a virtues acknowledgement. <laughs> I said, you know, I really, hear your passionate commitment to your point of view. And I meant it. Thank you. How do the virtues point us toward the alternative reality which most religionists believe will characterize our life after death? How does the virtues project point us to that existence? Oh, the virtues project doesn't get into that. <laughs> Although my books do. The books I've written are, are very, uh, <clears throat> what should I say, revealing of my perspective that all of us have, for example, an A-team. In my book, uh, A Pace of Grace, The Virtues of a Sustainable Life, I talk about the A-team of the angels, our advisors, and our ancestors, that we need to turn to them for guidance. So I don't really hold back, but I'm not sure I I guess it's all part of the virtues project because when we talk about honoring the spirit, you can really um, look at the mystical side of life. And so, you know, I don't want people to cut themselves off from that kind of spiritual help. So it's there in the books. And it's certainly there in the scriptures that we quote in the Family Virtues Guide and in some of the cards that we have created, the virtues cards. And some of them are fine for business or American schools that don't want any mention of God. So, um, but yeah, we, we don't shy away from that really. But it's not, I don't think a lot of virtues facilitators talk about life after death when they're teaching the virtues project. But if people read the books, they'll, they'll see it there. 
You know, I just want to say something to you about that. I think that is something people are really curious about. And I think learning about life after death and the rich teachings that Baha'u'llah has given us, because, you know, Jesus said, in my father's house are many mansions. There are things mentioned in past religions about the next world. Baha'u'llah goes further and he tells us so much about what to expect. You know, that we will recognize one another, that when we get to the next world, what we bring with us are the virtues we've acquired. There's so much there. So I, I really encourage those of you who have a strong belief in life after death to, to really share that with people. You know, if it comes up where you could bring it up. Thank you. Um, I have a question. So you said you talked about how virtues are endowed to us by God. I mean, what would you say to someone who says that humans are just highly evolved animals and, and we don't have inherent virtues? I'd probably say, well, that must be a very sad thing to believe. But I would probably point out, um, <clears throat> ask them, well, what do you think allowed Joan of Arc to ride into battle as a young girl? What do you think um, allowed Greta Thunberg, who is an autistic child, to stand up to the United Nations and tell them, how dare you steal my childhood and be a total advocate for climate uh, healing? So what would you call that? What would you call, you know, I, there's so many examples of virtue. And the truth is everybody uses virtues language in some way. You cannot turn on the TV or watch a video or without hearing some mention of virtues, virtues of hope, virtues, kindness, excellence, courage. Can sincere beliefs in virtues without a belief in God create the organic change you prefer to? I think that that is a very limited um, kind of belief if one just believes that people are good and because the plans that come to us from God are actually the way to, <clears throat> to move forward. And it's a, a huge advance in one's way of thinking. If one takes any faith and practices it as taught, not as typically practiced. But to me, the, everything comes from God. And the, the vision of Baha'u'llah comes from God. And so, <clears throat> you know, I, I believe there are really two, you know, we talked about those three purposes. To know and love God is the first task of humanity. <clears throat> now, having said that, some of the best people I know consider themselves agnostic or atheist. And to me, they're living examples of a godly life. So it's not that simple. Thank you. <clears throat> How can we use the virtues to address and heal racism in our communities? Well, that is a long topic. We know that this is the, <clears throat> according to our writings, that this is the most challenging issue facing America, and I think also everywhere in the world. One of the virtues we need to use to heal racism is to tell the truth. We live in such a systemic culture of racism that we don't even see it. It's like a fish doesn't see water. And so we need to be truthful and we need to have the courage to look at the truth about what <clears throat> white supremacy has done all over the world to so many different groups of people. We need to call on our compassion to take that journey and to the courage really to listen to the truth and the pain. <clears throat> A lot of our work with the Virtues Project, sorry, I'm losing my voice now, <clears throat> is um, in the healing of residential school abuse with First Nations people. And the virtues 
healing circle where they not only empty all of that abuse and that worthlessness and that sense of shame and the loss of generations of parenting, um, but they receive virtues acknowledgments from their peers. They learn the virtues language and they, so it's really important for us to have virtues language for ourselves in a way of thinking through the lens of virtues because it's time for some redemption. And there's a prophecy amongst the Talpan people of Northern Canada that the blue-eyed people, I know a lot of you have brown eyes, but the blue-eyed people are, have to be part of the healing of the nations because they are the ones that committed the crimes in the first place. So if you don't have courage, if you don't have honesty, if you don't have a passion for compassion, you can't heal, we can't heal racism. And we have to love above all, we have to love unity and diversity. We have to honor our differences and enjoy them and see them as a source of, of cultural richness rather than a reason to kill each other or blame each other or criticize each other or uh, we just have to really think differently. We have to come into a whole new consciousness about who we are as a human race. You know, I've started doing something. I'm sick and tired of being asked what my race is on forums, so I just say human. I refuse anymore. I'm sure I'm a mixture of something back there in the South. <laughs> my mother was from Mississippi. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, how can we use the virtues to address child and wife abuse to stop controlling co coercive domination? I want to answer that in five minutes. Okay. <laughs> That's a huge question. It's a, it's a very thoughtful question. I really believe that only a holistic approach to mental health is going to heal any of this kind of violence. I've worked with abusers in my practice, um, in my early days as a psychotherapist, and I had to find the goodness in that person who had held her two-year-old's hand under boiling water because he was naughty. You know, I had to find a way to love her and to find that goodness in her and she was able to heal herself with a lot of help. And until she was healed, her child was kept in co protective custody, really, in a, in a foster care home. But if we don't include the spiritual dimension, we won't reach them because they have a soul. And if you can touch the soul of that person, you know, they say hurt people hurt people. There is a lot of pain in someone. Any of us that have committed things that we regret, it came from our pain. So we need someone to see us as more than the worst thing we've ever done. I, I've done a lot of work in prisons uh, with the Virtues Project. And um, I always say to them, you know, you're way more than the worst thing you've ever done. And some of them, it's the first time they've ever believed that they had anything good about them. Teachers are finding this out. When they say, tell a child a virtue they see in them, nobody ever told me anything good about myself. So it's very simple. And it's very powerful. And, you know, just bear in mind that the vision that the Baha'i faith presents is way bigger than the Virtues Project, but the Virtues Project is based on those things and all the things that Jesus and Buddha and Muhammad and Krishna taught us about what is really important in life. And I just, you know, if you remember nothing else from this time together, um, please remember that you have the power to change the world by continually transforming yourself, fighting those spiritual battles, 
and believing that you are loved and you are here at this particular time for a reason. You aren't here by accident. You're here by design. And this is a very interesting time to be alive where the world is going through those death pangs and those birth pangs at the same time. Be a force for that good in the world in whatever way you can. You know, um, Jalaluddin Rumi, one of the people I want to meet when I get to the next world, I just adore him, his poetry. And he said, let the beauty we love be what we do. There are hundreds of ways to kneel and kiss the ground. So find your service and let it be something that really ignites your joy. Because joy is a very important virtue. Thank you so much. How can we use the virtues to console the families who lost their loved ones, um, like their children in recent mass shootings? Well, I'll tell you one thing. Um, one of the people here, Dara Feldman and I were called to, and my husband, Dan, we were asked to come to Pocatello, Idaho after a murder of a beautiful young woman by two students. And um, in that situation and in many situations where there's been tragedy, there is a deep need for people to gather and process and share and empty their cups and grieve together. And that grief is balanced by giving them virtues acknowledgments. So we strongly recommend the virtues approach of healing circles. And if you say, if you're in a community and you have, you want to bring people together to talk about things like this and to heal and to cry, you can do it if you have clear boundaries around that circle. Because we have very clear boundaries in these healing circles. No one is there to give advice. We're only there to listen with compassion and receptive silence, and then give each other virtues acknowledgments. It sounds very simplistic, but I've done this in, in the Yukon, I've done this in prison. Uh, it's absolutely essential because a lot of times people don't get a chance to, to go through their grief with anybody. They're just left alone with it. It's, it's, and they need to circle up. They need a place that is safe. And the safety comes in the silence of the circle. So it's a particular approach uh, of, of healing. And it always ends with virtues acknowledgments because when people empty out, they need to be restored again because otherwise they walk away with a gaping wound. You've got to restore them with an accurate virtues acknowledgement. And the way you do that is you say, you know, I, I see your whatever the virtue is, and, and here's how I see it in you. You know, one of the most touching things I have ever seen in my life is when I was doing um, week-long retreats with uh, the men, then the women, then the youth of a native community in the, in the Yukon. And this young man who was illiterate learned by listening of how to give a virtues acknowledgement and he ended up teaching it to the whole community. When we got back to these 250 people in the community, he taught the language of virtue. And he became so adept at accurate mirroring of something you see in the person. So, <clears throat> Paimane, I want to acknowledge you for and your family for your creativity in this service you're offering of giving these these Baha'i gatherings and firesides to people. Thank you. Um, how do you heal from emotional abuse and lies and deceit? Is it possible to heal? It's always possible to heal if you get someone to help you. You need prayer. You need someone that can hear everything you have to share about it. You need to empty your cup and you need to begin to see yourself through the lens of virtues. What have you learned from this? What are the strengths that you've attained? 
don't underestimate the importance of your endurance. But a lot of times when people have been abused by any family member especially, they need to change the narrative that they tell themselves and their self-talk. So one of the disciplines of acquiring the virtues or knowing and loving God and knowing that you are a reflection of God is to change the way you speak to yourself. You change, I'm so stupid, to, oh, I need to use more wisdom. You change, how could I have been so mean to my child, to, I want to be kind to my child now that he's 52 or whatever he is. You have to change the narrative with the power of language, with the power of the spirit. But you definitely can heal no matter how old you are, no matter what's happened to you. You need to hold on to your hope and realize that God loves you and wants you here for a reason. And the one thing that I found about people that have suffered a great deal is that it really carves a lot of compassion out of them. Not always. Sometimes it distorts itself into violence. But very often people that have been deeply hurt have the greatest heart of compassion. So notice what your gifts are and really focus on those. The other thing is to find your service and focus on other people's needs. And that can really bring you out of depression. I know from personal experience. Thank you. Do we have any last questions? I just want to thank everybody for these very thoughtful questions. Yeah, agreed. I love good questions. Well, looks like that's it. So thank you so much. Really inspirational and so pertinent for today. And also we all thank you for all your years of service and even creating this program and this language you, of Padre. how to educate people. Thank you. Thank you. So our, to be with you. thank you. So our speaker next week will be Mr. Steve Sarowitz. His topic is, can you be Jewish and Baha'i at the same time? So again, these talks are at 12 p.m. noon Eastern time uh, every Saturday. And I put the link to our contact form in the chat if you're not on our mailing list already. Thank you, everyone. And we'll see you next Saturday. Bye.